welcome to the West Cork History Festival 2021. As you may know by now, we are digital only this year. And uh, one of the themes that we're exploring is Ireland and Empire. And um, on a very hot day in West Cork and London, we are going to go to, um, to the polar regions of the world, uh, to cool down a bit. Um, we have got Dr. Claire Warrior, who is a senior curator at Royal Museums Greenwich in London, which uh, many of you may know. And she was one of the curators of the recent Polar Worlds Gallery. Um, and her PhD, which she did at the Scott Polar Research Institute in Cambridge, um, was called Rekindling Histories, Families and British Polar Exploration. So she's very interested in the way that family and local and national histories are entwined um, and who we remember and how we remember them. And she's going to speak uh, to us on the subject of the Irish in polar exploration. Um, we have an associated event actually um, at 8.30 p.m. on the Saturday of the festival. We will have a live festival concert performed by Jesse Kennedy and Tess Leek and the Vesper team quintet. And that has been inspired by the Franklin expedition, um, which included um, Irishmen on the expedition. And uh, it's called Hope on Hope Ever, and the music for that's been specially written for the festival concert. So if you see this talk, uh, please do go on our website and book tickets for that concert. Uh, I will now hand over to, uh, to Claire, and uh, she has a presentation to give. And um, thank you very much, Claire, over to you. Thank you very much, Victoria. Um, there is an embarrassment of riches about what I'm going to talk about, so um, I hope I haven't tried to cover too much ground. And I do also hope that you forgive me any errors in my pronunciation. I have tried to make sure I don't make any, but apologies if I do. Today, I'd like to talk about some of the Irishmen, and they were, in the period I'm talking about, all men, who ventured north or south, and on the rare occasion, to both, to the coldest, most remote regions on Earth. Some have been partially forgotten, others lionized as heroes, but all made their own important contributions. I'd like to do two things. Firstly, I'd like to place the men I'm talking about in historical context, outlining what they did and why it was important. Where I can, I'd like to give you a sense of their place within a broader history. And sometimes that can be a bit complicated because different expeditions kind of cross over. And I'd like to link to some of the artifacts that we have relating to them, particularly in the collections at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, London. We know more about some of these men than others, it's true, but where I can, I'd like to share some insights so that we can consider them with complexity and nuance. In terms of historical context, the period I'm looking at as Michael Smith, who's written a lot about the Irish role in polar exploration notes, marks Ireland's time under British rule until just about the moment that the Anglo-Irish Treaty of Independence was ratified in 1922. This is the so-called heroic age of polar exploration from the end of the Napoleonic Wars onwards, although the terms most commonly used with Antarctic exploration in the 20th century. Perhaps the Irish presence has been less well known than it might have been. And again, as Smith notes, there was a significant presence for Irish sailors in the Royal Navy in the early period covered here, for about 10% of sailors were Irish during the Napoleonic Wars, according to him, and they would have been serving at the beginning of the period I'm talking about. Similarly, towards the end of the time I'm covering, several of the explorers I'll mention served in the British Royal Navy, although many were silent about their work. Given one of the overarching themes of this year's festival, as uh, Victoria has mentioned about um, empire, I'd like to argue up front as my sort of second key moment that polar exploration can't be removed from the context of empire, even if it has sometimes appeared to be outside of it, and that Irish sailors serving in the British Royal Navy were clearly part of this imperial context too, in very complicated ways. Perceptions of the Arctic and the Antarctic as separate, distant, removed and disconnected are just that, perceptions carefully constructed to put forward a particular world view. Polar exploration is often absented from empire as it's characterized as being about science. While of course scientific research aims to be objective, it is always embedded in specific social, cultural and economic context and related to issues of power. 
Furthermore, many of the men involved in polar exploration had extensive naval careers and had often traveled widely in the Royal or Merchant Navies. So they too were entangled in the British Empire. I'll begin in the North. Earlier histories of Arctic exploration were driven by commerce, either in the search for whaling grounds or for a Northwest Passage, a sea route across the top of North America that it was hoped would provide a swift passage to India and China and lucrative trade there. It soon became apparent that there was no such swift route, but after the end of the Napoleonic Wars, Britain had a large underemployed navy, and this, combined with imperatives for scientific and geographical exploration, contributed to a resurgence of interest in the cold environs of the Arctic. My first explorer is Edward Sabine. Born in Dublin in 1788 to an Anglo-Irish family, born, in fact, when his parents were visiting relatives. He trained at the Royal Military Academy in Woolwich before serving in Canada during the War of 1812. Sabine became increasingly interested in science, in astronomy, magnetism and ornithology. His first polar voyage was as an astronomer on an expedition led by John Ross to search for the Northwest Passage in 1818 the same year that he was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society. Sabine untook, undertook pendulum experiments, made numerous magnetic measurements and discovered 28 bird species, including the one that you can see here, which is named after him, Sabine's gull. He also wrote an account of the Inuit of the west coast of Greenland. The expedition itself was not a success with Ross seeing what he thought was a mountain, a mountain range, which he christened the Croker Mountains, and that convinced him to turn home. But this was something of a mirage, and actually other members of his crew encouraged him to sail on. And when he returned, he returned to the contempt of Sir John Barrow, the second secretary of the Admiralty, who thought that he should have carried on. To add insult to injury, Ross appears to have co-opted some of Sabine's scientific work as his own. His second expedition north with William Parry on the Hecla was much more harmonious. Sabine was known for his productivity. One obituary described how, quote, his mind and his pen were incessantly at work. He published more than a hundred scholarly papers throughout his career. One of the longer lasting polar legacies was also written in written form on this second expedition. The establishment of a tradition that continued throughout the heroic age polar newspapers. You can see some of them here. Um, this is actually not the one that Sabine founded, which was the North Georgia Gazette, um, because that uh, is not quite as visual as some of the later ones. But you can see uh, to the right the facsimile of the Illustrated Arctic News, which was produced on board um, HMS Resolute, which you'll hear more about later. And uh, in the 20th century, the Discovery Expedition led by Robert Falk and Scott, Ernest Shackleton was the editor of the South Polar Times when it uh, was uh, written. So, uh, as well as more pendulum experiments for which uh, Sabine was awarded the Royal Society's Copley Medal, his edit editorship of the newspaper, the North Georgia Gazette and Winter Chronicle, established this popular tradition, which really gave the men a chance to bond together, to be uh, humorous and to consider some of the situation in which they were in. And it's one of my very favourite things about the polar regions. Turning south, our second explorer is more elusive, and yet his achievement was a monumental one. The first sighting of the Antarctic mainland, probably as I'll discuss later. Edward Bransfield was born in the harbour village of Ballinacura, County Cork, the son of a fisherman. I can't show you an image of him as there's no known portrait. He was impressed into the Royal Navy from his father's boat when he was 18 in 1803, as the Napoleonic Wars led to an increased need for men. Bransfield was clearly talented, rising through the ranks to become a ship's master. He stayed in the Navy after the war ended and was sent to Valparaiso as part of the Pacific Squadron. It was from there that he was sent to investigate a report from a Captain William Smith of a sighting of land further south than had ever been reported. What you can see on the left is what Bransfield found on the 30th of January 1820, the Trinity Peninsula, the northernmost part of the Antarctic Peninsula. 
Unfortunately, Bransfield's journal of the expedition is lost, but his charts did make it to the safety of the hydrographic department. Now, I mentioned a controversy about this first sighting. Fabian von Bellingshausen, who was exploring on behalf of the Russians, has also been credited with making the earliest sighting some two days earlier, although he himself made no claim to have found the continent. Who got there first is perhaps a redundant question question that reinforces imperial mindsets. Recent research from New Zealand suggests that Maori voyagers sighted the Antarctic long before any Europeans. We don't know much about the rest of Bransfield's life other than that he was married three times and died in Brighton at the age of 67. Nevertheless, his name lives on in maps of the Antarctic and in January 1920, January 2020, a memorial to him was unveiled in the place where his seafaring adventures began. Returning to the Arctic, one of the most famous expeditions of the Victorian age was another search for the Northwest Passage led by Sir John Franklin. And some of you may have seen the recent series, The Terror, which is a, a very fictional depiction of this particular expedition. In May 1845, HMS Erebus and HMS Terror set sail from Greenhithe in Kent, determined to sail through the icy, icy Arctic archipelago and find that elusive Northwest Passage. The expedition was to become one of the most notorious mysteries of the age, for the ship and all the men disappeared, never to return home. The second in command of the expedition was Francis Crozier from Banbridge in County Down. And he had already had a remarkable polar career and must arguably be one of the greatest Irish polar explorers, indeed one of the greatest polar explorers full stop. Crozier joined the Royal Navy in his early teens and by the age of 30, he'd voyaged to the Arctic three times. On his second expedition led by Edward Parry, the pattern for British overwintering in the Arctic was set when the ships became stuck in the ice near Iglulik. Subsequent voyages made use of Parry's formula, anchoring ships in safe harbour, taking down the top masts, constructing canvas roofs over the top and building up walls of ice around the vessels. There was daily exercise running around the ship to the sound of a barrel organ a clear emphasis on hygiene, health and education. Literacy rates on polar voyages were actually very high for the sailors because a conscious effort was made to educate them during the dark winter months. During this time, the men visited the nearby Inuit community of Iglulik and Crozier learnt to speak their language in Nuktut. In 1839, Crozier was selected to command HMS Terror on a voyage south, accompanying James Clark Ross in HMS Erebus to conduct magnetic observations and hopefully locate and get to the South Magnetic Pole. Along the way, the crews set up magnetic observatories at St Helena, Cape Town and the Kogolan Islands, getting to Hobart, Tasmania in 1840. And this is a, a, an illustration, a watercolour by a, a Tasmanian artist called Thomas Bock. And you can just about see uh, John Franklin, Francis Crozier and James Clark Ross there and the observatory that they had been working on building and they established that um, observatory in the early 1840s. On the 1st of January 1841, the ships crossed the Antarctic Circle, forcing their way through the pack ice of the Ross Sea and making a, a large number of significant geographical discoveries en route. They spent the time in this expedition basically sort of crisscrossing between Australia and uh, Antarctica. So they wintered there uh, in Australia the next uh, season and then completed one more season in and around the Ross Sea and the east coast of the Antarctic Peninsula. Now, this was pretty hard going stuff. It, the conditions were harsh and the tribulations that uh, were, were endured on this Antarctic voyage were enough to make James Clark Ross hang up his exploring boots, at least temporarily. He got married and promised his wife that he wouldn't go to the polar regions again. But Crozier decided to return as second in command of the British Naval Northwest Passage Expedition, led by Sir John Franklin. Crozier was somewhat morose at the time of departure because his romantic overtures to Franklin's niece, Sophia, had been rebuffed. 
and he talks in some of the last letters that we have from him uh, back home about the way in which he's feeling despondent and, and he's not really wanting to sort of speak to people or be very social or con convivial. Nevertheless, when the expedition set sail, it did so with confidence. Uh, there wasn't that much of the Northwest Passage left to chart. About 90 miles of the, the part that they were hoping to get through was, was uncharted at that moment. And the ships and the equipment that they had was very much up to date. Everything had been refurbished. So there was no reason to think that this wouldn't be a very successful trip. And yet, no one came back alive. At least three other crew members of HMS Erebus and Terror were Irish, although we know much less about them than Crozier. Nevertheless, it's important that while we often remember the leaders of expeditions, every crew member had a role and they were valued and significant both in terms of the working of the voyage, but also as someone who left friends and family back home. Two of these crew members were Royal Marines, one James Daly, aged 30, from Tubber Clare in County Westmeath, enlisted in Birmingham in December 1838. What we know about these men, we really know from the muster books, and there's been some um, excellent work done into them. Uh, we know that Daly was a labourer. He was five foot nine and a half inches tall with black hair and grey eyes. William Pilkington, 28, was from Kilrush in County Clare. He was five foot eight inches tall with dark brown hair, hazel eyes and a sallow complexion. And he had enlisted in Bath in November 1834 at the tender age of 17 years and nine months. Both men were privates third class. And men often enlisted in the winter when work was otherwise scarce. It was a means to, to get an income. And the Admiralty records tell us really all we know about them. Finally, Cornelius Hickey, aged 24, was a caulker's mate helping to ensure that the ship remained watertight, having trained as a shipwright. He was originally from Limerick and had just returned from service in the Mediterranean on Belvedere, being discharged in March 1845. He is described as having black eyes and hair, a fair complexion and his face marked with the pox. Now we have a couple of objects in the museum collections associated with him. Uh, one is this spoon. Uh, originally belonging to one of the officers, Lieutenant Fairholme. The spoon has the Fairholme crest, a dove with an olive branch on it, and the motto, Spero Meliora, I hope for better things, which uh, I guess is a little ironic in this context. And scratched just below the uh, crest, although you can't see it very clearly in this image, are the initials CH, and that's assumed to be Hickey. It was collected from Inuit in Naujat, uh, once known as Repulse Bay, by John Ray in 1854. Finally, this knife was clearly Hickey's, but look closely at the blade. It's stamped Millikin, a business selling microscopes and medical equipment based in London. So was it repurposed by Hickey from equipment on the ship? As with so much of this expedition, we simply don't know. Because after three years of absence and no word sent back home, the men's families and the Admiralty begun to wonder what might have happened. But actually, we know relatively little. Nevertheless, numerous searches were sent out to find the missing men. And there were several notable Irish leaders here too, whose seagoing routes were very much intertwined. From County Tipperary, Henry, Kelly, Henry Kellett evidently took pride in his Irish identity. His naval service had taken him all over the world, including five years in the West Indies, and he was uh, participated in the First China War. During his time commanding HMS Resolute as part of Edward Belcher's major search expedition from spring 1852, Kellett led a search with sledges for the elusive expedition. And you should be able to see the sledges here. Now, launching on St. Patrick's Day, he, quote, as a loyal Irishman, determined on launching the sledge with all the honours. The sledge, Erin, carried a green flag, and I think that's what you can see in, with my really uh, badly drawn red circle there. It was a green flag with the captain's crest in the centre, the Union flag in one quarter, and the Irish harp in the bottom right. You can't really see that, but I'm hoping that's because it's kind of folded over towards the back. We'll talk a little bit more about HMS Resolute anon. Wexford man Robert McClure had first served in the Arctic in 1836 on HMS Terror. 
one of the ships that he was ironically later to search for. On this expedition, the vessel had become trapped in the ice and eventually limped back across the Atlantic, make, making it back to County Donegal, a baptism of ice, if you will. His service continued in Canada and on the West Indies station before the search for the 1845 expedition began in earnest. The first search he was involved in from 1848 to 9 brought back nothing, but the second was very much more eventful. HMS investigator set off from Woolwich, England in January 1850 with McClure in command. The ship made painfully slow stop-start progress and missed its initial rendezvous with companion ship HMS Enterprise. Sea ice frequently impeded the journey, forcing the ship to become stationary. And by 1852, scurvy and malnutrition were a real problem, which the men did attempt to offset by gathering fresh sorrel and hunting fresh meat. McClure very much focused on keeping spirits high and he was a very popular commander, but the conditions and the men's health continued to worsen into the next year, with this winter's temperature, the third the men had spent in the Arctic, the coldest, sinking to minus 55 degrees Celsius. It was only in spring 1853 that help arrived in the form of Lieutenant Bed Bedford Pym of HMS Resolute, who had made the 160 mile journey by dog sled. Investigator was abandoned and it took two weeks for the men to trek to the Resolute under the command of fellow Irishman Henry Kellett. But there was still no respite from the ice and HMS Resolute too became trapped. So the crew of HMS Investigator spent a fifth winter in the Arctic, which was pretty much unprecedented. And eventually Resolute 2 was abandoned on the order of Expedition Commander Belcher, despite Henry Kellett's protests. The end of this gruelling ordeal came in October 1854, when the men from these ships finally reached England, having managed to get home via two summer supply ships and the depot ship North Star. Perhaps the only saving grace was, in the course of the expedition, McClure is credited with completing the first Northwest Passage by boat and sledge and received a reward accordingly, although this over time has been disputed. And actually Jane Franklin, Franklin's widow, was very much one of those people disputing it because she wanted the, uh, the honor of discovering the Northwest Passage to go to Franklin and his crew in some ways, um, kind of reflecting the sacrifice that the men had made and, and making it seem as if the kind of loss of life in a lot of ways wasn't futile. And as it turns out, Kellett's instinct about the Resolute was correct it was eventually freed from the ice intact, discovered by American whalers and restored back to England. When it was eventually broken up, the wood was used to make this. President, the president's desk, uh, the wooden desk in the Oval Office, and this is how uh, the office looks at the moment with the desk uh, under President Biden. My final Franklin searcher is Leopold McClintock on whose expedition one of the most important Franklin artifacts was found. McClintock was from Dundalk and another Royal Navy early starter, joining up at the age of 11 in what was then a period of peace. The Arctic was to absolutely be his making. In February 1848, he joined James Clark Ross's Enterprise expedition searching for Franklin, and he learned the art of Arctic sledging from him Clark Ross having already learnt it really from the Inuit communities with whom he'd spent time on that expedition that Crozier was also on. McClintock was to go on to develop the system of man hauling used on other expeditions, although he personally began to advocate much more strongly for the use of dogs. He was part of the same major search expedition as Henry Kellett's, albeit on HMS Intrepid rather than the Resolute, and so his experiences were slightly less traumatic. But it was after this expedition that McClintock's Arctic career really soared. He became an advisor to Lady Franklin, John Franklin's wife, who was very much a tenacious driving force behind the search expeditions, many of which she funded herself. And she made McClintock commander of one of them in the yacht Fox, which set sail in July 1857. 
Although earlier search expeditions had undoubtedly brought back evidence of the 1845 expedition's movement, particularly by gathering um, artefacts from uh, local Inuit communities, uh, listening to their testimony and tracing the route of the men really down uh, the west coast, uh, the west coast of a, a small island off, off uh, the Canadian coast uh, called King William Island. Um, John Ray, in particular, uh, was a very important uh, part of that search, uh, even though sometimes some of the things that he talked about were not what the British establishment wanted to hear. But the importance of McClintock was that his expedition returned really with the only piece of clear written evidence that we have about the expedition's fate to date. So on the left, you can see the Victory Point record, as it's called, because it was found at a place that had been named Victory Point. And this is really two separate notes, uh, the first of which seems to suggest that everything's fine. You can see, hopefully, Sir, Jan Sir John Franklin commanding the expedition all well, uh, boldly underlined. Although the fact that Franklin himself hadn't signed this does suggest that perhaps things weren't as all well as they might have uh, seemed. And then around the edges of the note, uh, you can see scrawled handwriting, which basically tells us that the men have been trapped in the ice for much, much longer than they expected. And that by the time they get to uh, mid-1848, they really have to abandon ship and try to march south and find help. What I would say is that while we only have this one piece of written evidence, Inuit testimony has uh, which has often been dismissed and disregarded, has actually proven to be somewhat crucial to finding the wrecks of the Erebus and the Terror. Uh, Parks Canada, the Canadian uh, Archaeological Service, have been searching for, for many years when in 2014 and 2016, respectively, they found HMS Erebus and HMS Terror. They've been painstakingly mapping and imaging the wreck sites and have retrieved more than 350 objects to date. McClintock maintained an active interest in polar exploration. He was very heavily involved in the Royal Geographical Society, was a member of the Admiralty's Arctic Committee and played a key role in the last really major British naval expedition to the Arctic in 1875 to 6. And he also bridges the Arctic and the Antarctic, being involved in the discovery expedition led by Robert Falcon Scott. And so it's south that we turn again. The heroic age of Antarctic exploration is epitomised by the expeditions led by Englishman Robert Falcon Scott and Irishman Ernest Shackleton. And don't worry, there will be more of him to come, although I suspect many of you are familiar with his story. The two men served together on one of the most significant expeditions of this era, the Discovery Expedition. Now, for many years, it's the officers rather than the ratings that people have heard about in histories of polar exploration, as perhaps some of my earlier stories have made evident. But thankfully, this has begun to change. And one such man, Tom Crean, is perhaps now one of the better known Irish polar exploration explorers and with very good reason. Born on a farm in Annascole in 1877, one of 10 children, Crean began his life in poverty. He left school at the age of 12 and joined the Royal Navy at the age of 15, an opportunity to both escape and provide for his family. He served with both Scott and Shackleton, spending longer on the ice than both men and outliving them both too. He worked diligently in the Royal Navy, becoming a skilled sailor, but he seems to have become unhappy with the naval life. It was on HMS Ringaruma, based at the Australian station, that an unexpected opportunity arose which was to change his life. The captain was asked to provide support to Scott's uh, expedition and the RRS Discovery in Littleton, New Zealand. The desertion of one of Discovery's crew presented an unexpected opportunity and Crean seized it, volunteering to take his place. On the journey south, he gained a reputation for being tough and skillful, but it nearly ended in disaster for him when he fell through the ice surrounding the ship and quickly pulled to safety. He was one of the men to reach the furthest south that had ever been reached, although that record was broken a month later by other expedition members. And when the men returned in 1904, Crean was command commended by Scott for his meritorious service throughout. And although he was given the opportunity to leave the Navy, he chose to stay on. On the Terra Nova expedition, his quick thinking ensured the survival of a small team of men 
when they became stranded on, a, on an ice floe overnight. The expedition was an attempt to reach the South Pole and to undertake scientific investigations, but it culminated in the tragic loss of the men who made the final attempt to race to the Pole. Crean was not one of those men for this final push, but in fact uh, had gone sort of part of the way for that journey, was not selected and then had to face an arduous trek back. But in doing so, he saved the life of his commander, Edward Evans, who'd been suffering from scurvy and snow blindness and was unable to walk. And Crean trekked 35 miles with meager rations and without skis to get help. In the Antarctic environment, such a journey would be expected to take several days, but incredibly, he made it in 18 hours. He was also one of the men sent to search for the polar party who had made the attempt on the pole, who had not arrived back as expected. He found Scott's body, kissing him on the forehead before the men's tent was left. Both Crean and Lashley, who had accompanied him in, in looking after Evans, received the polar medal and the Albert Medal in recognition of their selfless bravery. His final expedition was the Endurance Expedition, a bold and ambitious attempt to cross the Antarctic continent led by Shackleton. He was one of the men selected on the rescue mission, mission in the James Caird lifeboat, which you can see here. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of this expedition, um, expedition's progress later. When the men, men finally returned home, they returned to find Europe still at war, and he continued, Crean continued to serve in the Royal Navy. He retired in 1920, his heroism in the most inhospitable, inhospitable environment on earth immense, and yet he never really talked about his adventures, retiring home to run a pub, the South Pole Inn, which you can still visit today. He died at the age of 61 in 1938. There were other remarkable Antarctic Irish too. Patrick Keohan, brought up by the sea in Cork McSherry, County Cork, was another Royal Navy recruit and served on the Terra Nova, telling Scott that he, quote, always wanted to see what's on the other side of the hill. Like Crean, he participated in numerous sledging journeys and was valued by Scott for his good humour and courage. On the return trek that he had to make, he was, again was not chosen as a member of the Polar Party for the final push. He fell down eight crevasses in about 25 minutes. And I, I really like seeing his sledge flag because it, it's um, the iconography of sledge flags is very interesting, combining it, you, they always had uh, the uh, George Cross on the left because in uh, they were devised by Clements Markham uh, in the late 19th century, and it was supposed to represent the fact that to take part in polar exploration, you had to be um, a true Englishman. But you can see that uh, while Kiahan has gone with that kind of tradition, he's also put his own mark on it and has got uh, a part of the flag that is very distinctively Irish. He actually sewed this sledge flag at the expedition base at Cape Evans and carried it with him during the journey. He served in the Royal Navy during the First World War and then in the Coast Guard service, working in both England and Ireland. He re lived the remainder of his life in England and a memorial to him was unveiled in his birthplace in 2012. Fellow Cork man, Robert Ford, was born uh, in Movedee uh, near Bandon in County Cork, and he also served on Terra Nova. I couldn't find many pictures of him, but you can see him on the right here. And he was part of the Western Party undertaking geological, geographical and glaciological research. He too served in the First World War and remained in the Navy until 1920. And in later life, people remember his bandaged or gloved hands because they were permanently damaged by frostbite. So people around uh, town would see him with his, with his uh, bandaged hands. Brothers Timothy and Mortimer McCarthy, and I couldn't find many pictures of them, I'm afraid, so this was the best I could do. Uh, you can see uh, Mortimer on the right and Timothy on the left. Came from Kinsale, known for its skilled mariners and fishermen. Mortimer was also on Terra Nova, and he was another young Royal Naval recruit. Uh, he was only 12 when he joined up, having lied about his age. Uh, and he'd emigrated to New Zealand as a young man and worked as a merchant mariner until, like many hundreds of others, he'd applied to be part of Scott's expedition. He was a member of the support parties to the attempt on the pole. He hoped to serve with his brother, Tim, on the Imperial Transantarctic Expedition led by Shackleton, 
but no place for him could be found. So he headed north instead, joining the Northern Exploration Company on an expedition to the Arctic before, like so many of us, serving in the Royal Navy in the First World War. He was actually one of the last surviving members of the Terra Nova expedition and was invited to Antarctica again in his, uh, in his 80s. And, and he went and in 1963 became the oldest man to visit the South Pole. Sadly, he died in a house fire in 1967. His brother, Tim, like Tom Crean, was one of the men chosen for the mammoth open boat journey, rescuing the men from the endurance expedition led by Shackleton, sailing those 800 miles in the cramped conditions of the James Caird lifeboat. He was a popular and reliable member of the endurance's crew, held in high regard by sailing master Frank Worsley, who called him one of nature's gentlemen and the most irrepressible optimist I've ever met. Tim remained with two of the other crew members who couldn't make the climb over the island of South Georgia when they landed at, um, on South Georgia to get help from the whaling station there. Uh, they landed on the wrong side of the island, so they had to climb over the top. What you can see is, I think, a memorial card to Tim, who was killed in the First World War. His ship torpedoed a, number of, a mere number of weeks after he returned from Antarctica. He was only 28. Finally, Perhaps one of the most uh, famous uh, Irish polar explorers, Ernest Shackleton, the boss, as he was known by his men, still one of the towering figures of polar exploration, renowned for his bravery, tenacity and leadership. Perhaps he needs no introduction and I'm not going to talk about him very much here because there is an awful lot to talk about and, and I don't have much time to cover it, but there are plenty of ways to find out more. Born in County Kildare, uh, although the family moved to London when he was very small, he was a restless and driven man, determined to make his mark on the world in his own way. As I've already mentioned, his first experience of the Antarctic was as a member of the Discovery Expedition, commanded by Scott. He was one of the men that made an attempt on the pole on that expedition in November 19, 1902. They made a new further south, but they didn't achieve the pole, and they all suffered badly from frostbite, snow blindness, and early symptoms of scurvy. Shackleton in particular was affected so much so that Scott sent him home on the relief ship the morning the, morning, the first time that they could uh, leave. But this was only a temporary hiatus for him. He chose to return to make his own attempt on the pole as part of the Nimrod expedition in 1907. He and his team got within 97 miles of their target, but he chose to turn back in the face of extremely difficult weather conditions. Writing to his wife, Emily, to let her know, he commented, quote, I thought you'd rather have a live donkey than a dead lion. Now I've mentioned the Imperial Transantarctic Expedition, sometimes known as the Endurance Expedition uh, after one of the ships already. This was an attempt to cross the continent via the South Pole, but one arm of the expedition was completely stymied when the ship Endurance became trapped and gradually crossed, crushed by the ice. The men were forced to live on ice floes for months eventually using the ship's small boats to reach the uninhabited Elephant Island. And it was from there that Shackleton launched one of the most audacious rescue missions in maritime history. Six men, a small boat and 16 days to cross the ocean. And they were aiming for the whaling station on South Georgia, as I've already mentioned, where they hoped that they could get help and a ship to uh, rescue the Elephant Island men who were sheltering under lifeboats at the time. So they arrived on South Georgia. They arrived at the wrong side of the island to the whaling station and uh, Shackleton had to trek over the top of the island and they were indeed successful in rescuing stranded men and none of that arm of the expedition uh, died. All the men came home safely. And it's in this expedition, perhaps more than any other, that Shackleton demonstrated his cap capacities as a charismatic leader, a mighty rushing wind, as he'd been called, taking all others with him by the force of his personality. His final expedition on the quest was to circumnavigate the Antarctic continent but it was cut short by his death from a heart attack off South Georgia in January 1922. And this effectively marks the end of the heroic age of Antarctic exploration and the wider heroic age that I've been talking about today. Buried in South Georgia, where he was happiest, according to his wife, and she gave permission for him to be buried there, 
His grave has a quotation by the poet Robert Browning on it. It says, I hold that a man should strive to the uttermost for his life's set prize. And Shackleton did indeed do this, pushing himself to the limits of human endurance. We're hoping to mark the centenary of his death with small display at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich. So I hope you'll look out for what might be going on. So this also marks the end of what I'm going to tell you about today. I hope I've given you a flavour of the rich, long involvement of Irish sailors in polar exploration, their complex careers, their bravery, tenacity and good humour in some of the most challenging environments on Earth. Monuments to many of these men can now be found in their birthplaces and many of their names are marked on the maps of the Antarctic today and for some of them in the Arctic too. And I hope it goes some way to uh, ensuring that their names and achievements are remembered. Thank you very much. That's great, Claire. Thank you so much. That was a really fascinating talk. Um, a couple of questions, if you've got time, that would be all right. Of course, and I can't promise to answer them, but I'll do my best. Um, I think probably the first thing is uh, you mentioned the terror and a lot of people will have seen it on television and Jesse's concert is inspired more actually by relationship, relationship Franklin had with his wife, but um, also including Crozier in that. Why do you think there's such a fascination with this expedition that ended so tragically? I think the fascination is probably because of absence in a way, absence of evidence, absence of of bodies, absence of really knowing what happened to the men. And there's there's this kind of gap that allows imagination. Uh, I mean, the terror is a very imaginative telling of that story. Um, and uh, for those that haven't seen it, uh, there's a supernatural polar bear that um, I, I'm pretty sure didn't happen. Um, but it does give beautiful characterizations of life on board ship. And it does give a real sense of um, personalities, although we, we actually know very, very little about that. But I think the thing with the Franklin expedition is it's it's a mystery. And um, even if the uh, wrecks of the ships, even if we can find much on them, and they have been bringing up artifacts, but there's nothing in the way of paperwork yet, although that that is, I believe, possible that it will have survived and be legible. In a way, I, I kind of hope that they don't find much evidence that tells us what happened, um, because the not knowing is more intriguing. And um, and I suspect that actually we we may never know, and and perhaps that's why the mystery lives on. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, connected to that also was um, something you mentioned about Crozier and also Bransfield. Um, a Crozier learning an indigenous language, and then when Bransfield was looking for the South Pole or the the landmass of the Antarctica the fact that Marys had already sighted it many centuries before, probably. I wonder if you could talk a bit about how indigenous um, accounts were, were sort of appreciated. I mean, it's a, a massive generalization, but in both those cases, very interesting interaction between different explorers and the indigenous population. Yeah, I mean, there was definitely a, a long history of contact with indigenous communities in the Arctic and a great deal of learning from uh, local geographic knowledge. So there's there's quite a famous uh, illustration from Ro one of John Ross's voyages, I think, which shows um, an Inuit man and woman, I think, actually sort of drawing a map for the British explorers to show them the terrain. Uh, the thing is that that kind of knowledge is often not made visible in the explorers accounts. So even though they relied on interpreters, they relied on local knowledge in various forms. You don't often see that, uh, but it was very definitely there. There was to some degree a sort of learning. I mean, Inuit are obviously consummate survivors in such a harsh environment and clothing is one of the key things that that uh, that helps you to survive there and, and British explorers do to some extent adopt some things from that um, from that kind of technology. Um, although um, Inuit kind of notice things like the fact I mean, if you see the terror, you see them wearing their naval uniforms and they don't have kind of fur hoods and that too Inuit is is crazy. Why wouldn't you why wouldn't you have a fur hood that kind of protects you from the wind and why would you be wearing those those uniforms? It's just madness. 
Um, and Inuit testimony, um, as I briefly mentioned, was really, really important in the Franklin expedition, but it was almost wholesalely at the time disregarded because Inuit reported that they had seen cannibalism and that was not what people back home wanted to hear. Um, and it was very painful for the families for sure. Um, but John Ray, who had brought back some of that testimony was effectively ostracized by the British establishment. Really, he was the only Franklin searcher that didn't get a knighthood. Um, and so, you know, there, there's, a, there's a history of kind of disregarding or making invisible Inuit contributions to polar exploration, really. Um, the Maori uh, um, exploration of Antarctica, it's not something I know very much about. There was a recent newspaper article about it, but given that Pacific uh, peoples voyaged over vast distances across the, uh, across the ocean, then perhaps it's not surprising that, uh, that they may have seen Antarctica um, before anyone else. Um, and perhaps sort of the framing of things as needing to always be about firsts is such a kind of imperial mindset anyway. Um, in some ways, uh, what does it matter? Um, but but clearly, we have always placed great store on that, and that's not that's not to um, denigrate the Maori achievement it, uh, it, of seeing Antarctica. If, if that and that's what their oral um, oral history um, is thought to say now. Thank you. And, and one just one final question about what seems like an obsession. I mean, for a lot of these men, the Irish and English sailors, it was um, there was an economic driver. You know, it was an occupation that was relatively good um, conditions in some cases, uh, education. But there also does seem to have been a kind of obsession with the polar regions. Like once you've gone on one and survived it, that you just had to keep going back. Would that be true, do you think? Yeah, I mean, sometimes um, I, I've met a couple of sort of contemporary polar explorers, although, um, you know, kind of discuss what exploration means. That's a huge question in, in and of itself. Um, but people sometimes talk about sort of you, you get ice in your blood. You you get this kind of thirst for returning to to a place. And and I don't know whether that's just because um, I don't know whether some of that's almost because you do find something of yourself in those environments. You see how far you can push yourself, or um, you you have a chance to sort of see how you respond in a situation of sometimes quite extreme pressure. I mean, people sometimes think of the Arctic and the Antarctic as being kind of very kind of um, calm, serene environments that are kind of peaceful, but actually they're very, very sociable environments if you're there because you're so dependent on other people that you, you have no choice. And I think there's also something about some of those places on, on, on earth that are relatively free from human impact. Um, I mean, Inuit have spent so many centuries living in, in, in complete kind of harmony with their environment and understanding it. Uh, and their, their footprint on that part of the world, if you like, is, is very light. And, and just the vastness of, of, of the Arctic and the Antarctic. I mean, they're obviously very, very different places in and of themselves. But I think that's sort of just, there is something about that environment that brings nature back to you and that's certainly what you see in the um in the uh 18th and 19th centuries this idea of the polar sublime where the, a place where nature is both beautiful and terrifying it's you're kind of on a knife edge as to which way things might go and you 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 everything there is bigger than you i think is something that people feel that's really interesting thank you well thank you so much for your talk and um yeah, it'll be up on the festival website uh, over the weekend. And uh, thank you again. That was a really brilliant talk. Thank you. My pleasure. I hope it all made sense. <laughs> <laughs>